think we're rolling. What's up, people? Gonna double check that the stream is coming through. This will be my first time streaming to LinkedIn Live. I was just approved yesterday. Yeah, I see the video. One, two, three. Oh man, there's the audio. Can I, uh, does my chat work with LinkedIn Live? Hi, cool people. So hi, cool people did not show up. Okay, so I'm not sure. So heads up if you're joining me on LinkedIn Live. First of all, thank you for watching. Um, I don't think I will get your chat messages. Um, or I won't be able to watch your LinkedIn Live comments. I won't be able to see them in real time. Just a quick heads up, but it seems like the audio and video is working, so that's really cool. So thanks for joining. If you're coming in from Twitch, welcome. If you're coming in from YouTube, welcome, welcome. Um, so what is the topic today? So the topic today is teaching people React. So um, go check out my TikTok. Here's my TikTok. Uh, yeah, just John Vandeveer, at John Vandeveer. I think that's also my Twitter. Uh, I think it's the same on Twitter. Um, but basically, like, my TikTok's been blown up. <laughs> I don't think I should put, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so it's the same on Twitter. John Vandeveer, and then uh, with a space on YouTube, John Space Vandeveer. Um, so I was surprised. I was just kind of messing around on TikTok, doing whatever, and um, surprised to see that it's been blowing up. And why has it been blowing up? Because I think people are hungry to learn how to code. They're also hungry to solve their financial issues, to work remote, you know, the pandemic has a lot of people stressed out. Um, so options for working remotely are appealing to a large audience. Um, options that like minimize your contact with other humans. Yeah, and, uh, and the really high employment rate. So, you know, not just salary, but employment rate. And of course, all the benefits. Um, people are really attracted to the value proposition of learning to code. Um, Go through my channel, I'm not gonna make the case here today, but basically I argue, and I've done this on YouTube in the past, argue that if you wanna to learn to code, if you're career switching into coding, the way to go is web technologies. So let's just, uh, and then if you're gonna do web technologies, you should learn React. So I'm just gonna be really quick about this. I'm not really making the case comprehensively. Stack Overflow Developer Survey, Top Languages, so like why, um, why web technologies and why React specifically? Um, most popular technologies. So most popular technologies among all respondents, JavaScript, HTML, SQL, Python, Java, Bash, C++, PHP. All right, that's about enough. We can go down to TypeScript. That's about enough, right? Um, let's say HTML and CSS and SQL and Bash, these are not programming languages. So really the top two are JavaScript and Python. There's actually a huge difference JavaScript and Python, like 50% more people doing JavaScript. By the time you get down to Java, um, there are some really compelling reasons not to go for Java and then it's just like no contest by the time you get to C Sharp. TypeScript is interesting because you can use it as an enhancement to JavaScript. So I like to see as an intermediate skill, people pick TypeScript up. Not really suggesting people become a TypeScript developer, but you become a web developer and this is a great differentiator that's gonna get you hired. Let's click over to professional developers. <clears throat> we have the same pattern, it's just a little more stark. So now instead of 68% JavaScript, it's 70% JavaScript. Python's still number two, but instead of 44, it drops down to 42. Java drops down. TypeScript pops up over PHP. So that it's the same take home message is that your top two are JavaScript and Python. Um, 
And so I, on TikTok, I've been making the argument, learn React, not Python. Again, not really making it comprehensively here. But basically, um, a lot of schools will teach Python and Java. Python's best use case, it's really targeted at data analytics. If you want to be a data analyst, go for Python, all for it. But if you um, want to be a programmer, I suggest JavaScript for a few reasons. Here we've established it's the top <coughs> language, just flat out. So that's going to have like uh, really high employment prospects, tons of documentation, big communities. So you get social networking effects, all these really great effects. Um, another reason is platform flexibility. So JavaScript is the only one that's widely accepted in web clients. <coughs> and like everyone needs a website, like every industry needs a website. Python, as we said, it's really good for data analysis. There's also servers. <laughs> if you want to work server side, you can go Python. Um, server side is like a smaller pool of jobs, right? So platform flexibility, JavaScript, you can do web, you can do front end, back end, full stack. You can do DevOps with Node. <coughs> you can do um, mobile with React Native. So you can really do everything except like operating system work <coughs> with JavaScript. You can do game development with JavaScript. So the platform flexibility, uh, and then it really preps your mental model to go anywhere. So JavaScript is a multi-paradigm language. It's functional and object-oriented. You can do both, and then you can also use it for scripting. So it really supports everything. Now, I think Python is kind of similar in that regard. Um, so it's not really a differentiator, but it is a good reason to go for JavaScript, that it preps your mental model to go out in any other direction, really. Another um, slight issue I have with Python is the fact that like <coughs> non-visible characters can break your app. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, I think it's not a big problem for me, and I use Python quite often, actually. Uh, but I, I find for juniors it's a pain. Uh, and then another thing is the backwards compatibility. So with JavaScript, we have old ES 2015 and prior. They're old, but they basically still work. And actually, that relates to React today, because if we go over to Free Code Camp, we'll get into this in a minute. But their um, curriculum is using um, functional components in the old syntax. Uh, but they still work. If you go for the old syntax in Python, that is to say like Python 2, um, everything's broken. It doesn't work. You have to have that <coughs> current Python. So, this has a bunch of different effects, but one is another just like job availability effect where I can learn new JavaScript and go get a legacy JavaScript job and like work on a legacy project. But I can't learn new Python, or at least there's a slightly bigger pain learning curve of learning the new Python and then having to backwards port that into old Python. It's not as seamless. <coughs> Okay, so for all these reasons, I think you should learn JavaScript, not Python. And then specifically with JavaScript, you should learn React. Again, I'm like not making the case really here, but let's just go to indeed.com and compare like, so Angular, Vue, and React are like the top three. Let's just go Angular, Vue, everyone knows Vue is small. So let's just go Angular, here's 21,000 jobs. <coughs> Compare it to React real quick. Um, and that's 36. Oh, hey, I've got Ema. Am I saying that right? Ema? Emma. If it's, if it's Emma, yeah. If it's Ema, just give me a capital E. <laughs> and, if, and otherwise, I'll assume it's Emma. Okay, great. So we can see 36,000 React compared to whatever, 20 for Angular. Bottom line is if you learn Angular, you're going to get a job, but um, you're going to set yourself up better with React. The other thing is that if I search Angular, I get 21,000 results, but this is combining Angular JS or version 1.x with Angular 2 plus, which are very different languages. Um, so that a bunch of these jobs are like legacy Angular JS jobs, which is like a legacy old technology. You can do that. You can get a job. Um, you can get a paycheck. Uh, you're going to be stalling and kind of slowing your career development slightly, though, if you go that route. So if you learn modern Angular, 
like if, it, if I just go to like Google Angular, you know, and like, you know, this one, the current modern one, angular.io. If I read through these docs and I learn this version of Angular, what is it on like 11 or 12 or something now? <laughs> they even say modern. It's modern Angular, not that old Angular. Uh, I just want the version, man. Maybe I should just go to the GitHub, right? You should just go to the GitHub if you want the version. Um, releases, where's releases? I don't know. Version. Can I go to their package, Jason, over here? Version 13. Oh, uh, so it says version 13 next, so I'm still not sure. Um, I think the stable version is 12, right? Because this indicates that 13 is the next version, the alpha, unstable. So if you learn Angular 12, um, they're going to be like thousands of less job opportunities. Um, because again, this is combining AngularJS 1.x and Angular 2 plus. Okay, we're just getting started. This was just the intro. So we're learning React, uh, and what does it mean to learn? What does it mean to learn React? Let me play my uh, my TikTok where I do part one of five. Welcome to my channel, you guys. I've been telling you to learn React, but what does it mean to learn React? How do you know you made it? This is going to be a five-part series. Follow the channel. We're going to get started with an overview today, but it doesn't need to make sense because we're going to dive into all the bits in the next four videos. Here we go. Remember these three acronyms. Once you master all the skills that these letters map onto, you know basic React, you're ready for your certification, and then you're gonna go apply to jobs. We're gonna start by learning React like a pirate. R, then it's fat JS Sense. and fatter JS. Chris, all React all is, I want you to think about it like this. It's JavaScript plus some stuff. It's fat JavaScript. Here are your three R's, React, REST, and Redux. We're gonna learn them in that order. Doesn't need to make sense now. We're gonna go through it in the next four videos. These are the five elements of React core, JSX, state, props, hooks, and functional components. That functional components is your F. After React core, we got rest with fetch and await, redux with thunks. Last video will be some optional intermediate skills. Let's go. Welcome to my channel, you guys. All right, cool. So that gives you the layout. Let's just do um, notepad, notepad online, rapid tables. That's fine. Can I change the background here? Uh, let me do this one. Nope. Yep, cool. So, um, uh, learn React like a pirate, which is R, which is R or <laughs> Yar. Um, I didn't say it in my video, but um, we could just say that this is like Yarn, <laughs> um, but then Yarn uses NPM, so. Uh, Anyway, we can make the Y yarn. What would the A be? <clears throat> Async await or something. How about that? Yar. Um, then there is um, fat, F A T, fat.js, and three is fat with pH. And two A's, right? Is it two or three A's? Two A's. Fatter. Fat and fatter. Dot JS. React is just JavaScript plus some other stuff. It's fat JavaScript. So this is kind of like the uh, the approach that I take, and I just whipped this up today. Uh, like opinions welcome. <clears throat> Please let me know if you have a better way to concisely explain this part of today's stream is brainstorming right um, how can we communicate react in these small time compact piece by like uh, piecemeal fashion that the media of TikTok forces us into or provides us cup half empty cup half full it's a two-edged sword um, so these are some kind of catchy ideas that I that I kind of came up with today um, so it's somewhat thought out, but I'm sure it can be improved on. So yeah, so let's learn React like a pirate. 
And then, uh, and what is this? What does this break down to? The R's is React, Redux, and uh, REST. Actually, React, REST, then Redux. React, REST, Redux. <clears throat> so what's the intention here? We need React Core, but I believe that if you know React Core, you don't know enough to be a React, a React developer. Um, and then of course, under the hood, uh, React under the hood, we'll have ES6, um, HTML5, CSS3, SAS is optional. Um, material, you know, bootstrap. These things are all kind of like, are all kind of optional in my book. Let me know if you think otherwise. Uh, like CSS and JS, basically the whole design aspect. <clears throat> I think it's important, but um, if I'm thinking at interview time, I think you can get through the interview without any of these, really. Um, cool. So these are all optional in my book. Um, I think these are essential. Uh, okay. Um, and so when thinking back to when I became a developer, I'm self-taught and I had barely learned how to do <laughs> Uh, XHR, right? XML HTTP request. Um, so that's like before fetch came out. <clears throat> and I had never, I distinctly remember during my interview being asked a question and even answering it. And I said, I think I know the answer here, but I've never used it. I think the answer is a promise. Um, and I got the answer right. and. And so he's like, it doesn't matter that you haven't used it. The fact that you know what that is, just barely put you over the line and we'll hire you. And I got a JavaScript developer role. So what this tells me is that this threshold right here, which I'm saying maps onto rest. So today's equivalent, fetch and a sync await. So that was when I got hired and then I've also like placed other people. Um, and this is like a bright line test that I use. When you are advanced enough to understand um, HTML requests, or I'm sorry, XHR requests, REST, network requests, um, and the kind of async paradigm that necessarily goes with it because those responses are, are asynchronous. Once you get to that level of JavaScript, I think you're hireable. Um, so when I learned this, I just learned it vanilla, right? Um, and I think if you learn it vanilla, that's great. But I think you're even more competitive. I, frankly, if you learn it vanilla, I think you can get a job at some places. It just wouldn't be a glamorous job. So if you want to improve your employment prospects, I see a huge gain from learning uh, React, React or Angular. And then, so like either one of them would be great. And then the win goes to React for reasons already specified. Basically learning a framework makes you look really good to employers. Uh, just quick plug, uh, when I talk about how it makes you look to employers, I am talking about this from the fact that I've placed people, I've run interviews and made hiring decisions. But I'm also talking about this from the point of view of an academic because I have a PhD in economics and this is my dissertation topic. Um, so you can go to Google Scholar and put my name in there. New digital education, right? Um, alternative post-secondary learning. This includes like portfolio theory, alternative credentials, so like the nano degree, the certification that you get from free code camp, the certification that you get from uh, Code Academy, the skill IQ from Pluralsight, these are all considered alternative post-secondary credentials and alternative post-secondary learning. 
hireability and educational prestige, I created the rule that distinguishes between a high prestige boot camp and a low prestige one. So like course report, you can go read the paper, I actually recommend it. Course report data, browse all schools. Um, what was it, 4.2, uh, it's 4. something. This paper is available for free, by the way. It was App Academy and the other one. Average prestige, actual schools, unaccredited. Uh, okay, that's on the scale of one to 10, but I want the course report rating. Results. 7.58, 10 point scale, yep, yep. Um, don't go to University of Nebraska. So App Academy, General Assembly, and Google are the three alternative learning providers with high prestige. Zeti is a cool thing. That's telling you about like job search data. <coughs> Yeah, I think it's in the conclusion. Fortune 50. Evaluated practical alternative credential selection strategies. One strategy is to leverage from industry leaders. Um, the second strategy is to use credential review aggregator sites. So course report is what I'm talking about specifically. 425, that's the rule. It's like the last paragraph in the paper. I should remember that. <clears throat> it's like looking around the results. Um, Okay, um, 425 or better. And so App Academy is 466. Really, you could use a bunch of these, um, like Low Wagon. But the thing is, is like Low Wagon's in France. So I'm not really familiar. But according to my rule, they should be good. <clears throat> it needs to be 4.25 or higher with, is it, I think it's 100 reviews or higher. Oh, minimum 400 reviews, sorry. So App Academy, Iron Hack, these should all be good. Um, but we do want to ask the question, do they teach React though? That's an important question. But these should all be good boot camps. Hundreds of ratings. There's Career Foundry. There's General Assembly. So General Assembly, um, I think at the time I wrote the paper, it was the lowest rated that still fell in the high rated category, if that makes sense. And then I have an eye towards the United States. That's my target market. Udacity's on here now. I don't think Udacity was previously even considered a boot camp by Course Report. I think they were considered a MOOC, but I guess now they're kind of like liberalizing that concept, which I am a fan of, I'll say. Um, so here's Correlation 1, which still looks good. Look at that, 496, but under 400 reviews. Um, so according to my research, uh, I can't give that a thumbs up, but looking at it, I would still probably give it a thumbs up. Um, I would personally probably taste, take that risk. Anyway, so that's how you can come over here and find a high quality school. <clears throat> you want it to be over 4.25, over 400 reviews. And then from there, check out my TikTok channel. I have some other tests. So that's like the group of good schools, but then you wanna narrow it down. Do they have the language that you need, right? Are they teaching the language that you need? What is their placement rate? So they might have a great rating because maybe like people just like really liked the learning, but what is their actual placement rate? What is their price? Is that price acceptable to you? These are all things you need to consider like Lambda School. Um, what, what is the Lambda School rating? Let's see. I, maybe I'll just stick with General Assembly. I'm not sure if Lambda School hits 425. Oh, they are on the number 425. That's crazy. I'm chill with Lambda School. They had a touch of controversy, but I'm actually a fan of them. <clears throat> um, they have an interesting pay um, payment plan, right? Where you don't pay till you get a job and all this and that. But I think General Assembly is doing the same thing these days now. Um, 
but they're quite oh they don't guarantee job see this is course report is really nice course report will just tell you right here let me see general assembly i'm pretty sure general assembly guarantees a job if it doesn't say so then i'm actually worried about course report accuracy You know what, actually, I don't know if they guarantee a job or if it's just like uh, you get your money, like you don't have to pay or something. So they don't guarantee a job either. It could be a matter of like how you define guarantee because some of these places will have a guarantee, but it doesn't mean that you're definitely gonna get a job. It just means that if you don't get a job, like you don't have to pay till later or you pay some really small amount or something like that. Um, that's what I do. If you work with me, I say you don't, you don't get a job, then you don't have to pay me. Um, so I can, I call that a guarantee, but does course report consider that a guarantee? I don't know. Anyway, general assembly definitely has deferred payment options, uh, but they're kind of expensive, right? So here's a difference of 0 0.08 between general assembly and Lambda school. I actually don't know off the top of my head who's more expensive. I think they're both kind of expensive, but maybe, but that's a trade-off that you got to compare, right? You got to say, well, let's just pick a number five grand. I just pulled that out of my hat is it worth paying an extra five grand to get that extra 0 0.08 you know waited for 400 reviews um that's your judgment call that's going to be a risk assessment on your side because at the end of the day we're looking at that rating and we're looking at that reputation and we're saying that that basically indicates a couple things one is it's going to be an indicator for your your placement rate and like the quality of your job on the other side that's gonna drive that rating. <clears throat> and also your experience while you're there, basically how torturous is it to learn while you're there. Um, those are like the two main things that I think this rating is driven by. By the way, I'd love to hear it if you think that there's other um, major contributing factors there. <clears throat> but that's kind of how I read it. So circling back, now we know how to find a good uh, boot camp. Um, so from the point of view of employers, based on my expertise with boot camps, familiarity with the labor market, we know that we want to learn React. I also happen to be a full-time developer, principal develop developer at Blue Cross currently. I use React a lot. Um, and I also use Python and other technologies. I actually have the great pleasure of working with some really cool technologies. Um, so. I don't want it to come off like I'm a big fan of React because I use it and it's what I know, therefore I'm, I'm recommending it. No, like I know a lot of technologies um, and there's really good reason to prefer React objectively. Um, so how do you teach it? So we know that you want to learn React, but how do you teach it? I think there is core React, and that's what I mean right, right here, core. Then there's this bright line test that, hey, we actually want you to know REST too. That's really important to get you hired as a web developer. And that's not included in React Core. So you could use Axios, you could use Fetch, you could use some different libraries. You could use something really cool like Stale While Refresh, which I'm a big fan of, but I think it's, for a new developer, this is a hard pattern. Um, I love it. But the other thing is, even if you learn Stale While Refresh, a lot of employers are not going to know <laughs> what you're talking about. So it's about more than learning the best technology in some kind of like performance oriented manner or efficiency oriented manner. We want you to learn the best technology from a job placement perspective. At least that's what I do when people come to me and they say, hey, John, I want to learn to code. I'm going to tell them I'll help you learn to code in a way that positions you to get a coding job. And I feel like once you're stable with that entry level coding job, for me, it was a world changer. You know, I don't know about you, but for me, like my financial life improved, my quality of life improved. If I wanted to learn interesting new tech, which of course I did, I could do that on the side after my nine to five, um, or even during my nine to five. At, at Capital One, um, we had, you know, depending on the sprint, this kind of changed. But for a while there, we had like one day each sprint where we just got to like learn new technology. Or it might've been like half a day each sprint. It's like half a day like one Friday afternoon every two weeks, I think it was, for a while there. Um, and yeah, and at Blue Cross, I'm learning new technologies. It's not necessarily driven by whatever I wanna do. A lot of it's driven by interesting diverse product requirements. 
um, but you still get to learn new technologies after you get your foot in the door. And really, it's that first job that's hard to get, the second, third, fourth, it's like so easy to get jobs after, after say your second job. Really even after your first job. Some people will kind of go, oh, you've had one job, like you're still a junior and poo poo you. Um, but after you've, that's really not a huge problem, it's like a little problem. And then after you've had a couple jobs, it's like, dude, don't talk to me. You wanna complain, I'll go get a job somewhere else. Okay, um, so that's React, REST, and then what about Redux? Why do we want Redux, man? Basically because employers want it, once again. I mean, Dan Abramov. Um, was right when he said you might not need Redux, right? He's been saying this for years. Um, did he create Redux? I'm not sure. But he was like a big uh, popularizer of it. And then Ben Awad is like a major React figure. Um, Y'all should go sub him on YouTube, by the way. Ben Awad, A-W-A-D. Oh, I did not mean to do net worth. <laughs> that was a Google autocomplete. That's not something that I even care about. But he's a cool guy. I don't just say that from watching him. I've actually done a hackathon with him. He's, pr he's really funny. He's done a lot of uh, more so comedy stuff for a while. But um, he did some serious React teaching, like React course. Um, yeah, full stack GraphQL TypeScript tutorial. Check that out, like both of these, really. Um, <coughs> and then I don't know what the difference is there. Maybe it's just like a shorter, shorter one. So he's done some serious teaching too. Um, so big props to Ben Awad there. Um, so, and, but he doesn't really use Redux. Uh, he's done, well, the st stateless thing, I don't know. A lot of people are like haters on Redux. Frankly, for literal years, I didn't want to use it, but I eventually bit the bullet because all the employers expect, there's like, your, there's like tier one employers that don't have this expectation. Tier one employers are really weird. Big N, Fang, they have like algorithm style interviews. If you pass that, you're, it doesn't matter, okay? Let's set them to the side, even though they're high prestige and really cool and they pay well and it's like really great they don't control the vast majority of jobs in the ordinary IT tech market for programmers. Um, so for the ordinary market, a lot of the employers don't understand the tech well themselves. Um, they just kind of look at what they hear are the best practices or what they hear tier one is doing and they develop a rubric and you pass or fail the rubric, right? And, and that's if you do a structured interview, which is the HR best practice, even by um, no-name companies, everyone recognizes a structured interview as a best practice, but there are employers that will just do an unstructured interview and they don't even have a rubric. It's just like, at that point, it's really social skills. They'll interview you and if they like your personality, they'll hire you, which is pretty terrible for their own internal bias mitigation and maybe their company culture and their company success. But we, like another time, let's talk because we can actually use that to our advantage as job candidates by pumping up our social skills, putting on a smiling face, careful with our wording, friendly voice, big smiles. And in some of those cases, you just get the job even if you have no clue what you're actually doing. And I think if, like, if you're like me and you've been in the industry for, for several years, almost a decade at this point, um, you've definitely met other programmers that really didn't know what they were doing. And you're kind of like, how'd they get a job? Um, and some of them are a true mystery, but I know the answer for some of them is they were just really nice and they just got through an unstructured interview, <laughs> um, which is cool. Good for them. They got a great job. Um, so I definitely want you to work on your social skills, uh, but I'm not going to bank on that. I don't think that you would have to go through a lot of interviews and fail a ton of interviews uh, to kind of land one of those by chance. So we're not gonna bank on that. Although if it happens to you, kudos. Um, what we're gonna bank on is you're gonna have social skills, you're gonna have web tech, and you're gonna go the extra mile by knowing a framework, by doing some personal projects, and by having some nice to haves. Once you have all that, now you're in like the 90, 95, very high confidence that uh, like I can put numbers on it. Like you're gonna do 50 to 100 
applications per week for four weeks, and then you have like excess of 92% chance uh, of, of getting a, an offer in that following month, basically. Um, yeah, so that's like some real data that I've done in the past. Stuff varies over time, but, uh, but that's been true in the past. Okay. So we want you to know Redux because it's what employers want. That took a long time to say that. Cool. Give employers what they want, baby. That's how we get a job. That's how we get a job. And yeah, Redux kind of kind of stinks, but uh, uh, like after you get a job, you can kind of do whatever you want after that. It's about getting the job. Even doing Redux, there's multiple ways to do that. Do we want like sagas, thunks, something else? The answer is, is we want thunks. Why? Because I've worked with some different things and I think that's the easiest one to teach, honestly. Employers don't care at that point. Employers don't know the difference between a thug and a sunk. Um, they don't know. Uh, you might have some developers that know, but the chill developers, they also don't care. It's like, either one, you're good. If you find a, if you find a developer who's like, oh, you know thunks, not sagas? Sorry, pass. Like, you don't want to work with that guy anyway, <laughs> right? Um, here's some nice to haves. Uh, testing, S SEO, um, accessibility, international, internationalization, multi-language, like multi, like multi-semantic. Like that kind of thing. Um, not just like learning, I mean, I guess you could say multiple programming language too. Sure, that's, that's a nice to have, but the thing about that is if you've learned multiple programming languages, why don't you have a job already? So I would say this is a job search smell. Um, in programming, we talk about code smells. A code smell is not actually a technical error or a technical problem. It just kind of makes you intuitively believe that there's a problem somewhere else or like something strange is going on. So it's not an error, it's like a warning. Kind of, we call it a smell. So I would say this is a job search smell. Is like you might you're you're probably like studying too much and not applying enough. Uh, if you literally know multiple programming languages and you don't have a job, and that might not be a bad thing. You might be like, dude, I just was programming because I like to make video games on the side. I never really wanted a programming job. Um, okay, great. So it was just a smell. It's just a kind of like, mm, what's going on here? It's not like there's actually an error. But my intuition here would be that um, there's like, great, you got the technicals down, but there's something wrong with the way you're searching for jobs. Or like maybe your social skills are poor, maybe your uh, English is a second language, and I don't mean that disparagingly. I've worked with English second language people and they can be really smart, um, but language can be a barrier to job, to interview performance. So, but there's ways to mitigate that. Um, like just pr literally just practicing talking with someone. So if you want to just practice speaking English with me, give me a shout. So these are some nice to haves. Um, uh, full stack is another nice to have. Um, uh, multi framework. Um, I would say this is not ideal use of uh, learning time. Uh, I think there's, for your career, there's better stuff that you can do. Um, and then, of course, social interview skills. So this stuff is all essential. Um, Yeah, this would be eight. Design chops. Um, Adobe Suite. Uh, Figma. I can't remember any of those other prototyping tools. What are they called? Envision, worked with that one. Webflow, Sketch. Okay, we'll put those. And people know what I'm talking about. Envision, Sketch. Webflow, Envision, Envision. Um, cool. Um, 
these are really these are really two different kinds of design. One is like on the right side we have like real actual designers, um, and on the left side we have like um, programmers with a strong emphasis on look and feel and style, but they're not actually designers. But really, all of these are nice to have. <clears throat> and then I guess we can put out um, marketing, web marketing, social media, um, digital analytics background. That's kind of a nice to have too, and that kind of relates over to design because, hey, if you make like this pretty stuff, then people click it, right? <clears throat> and we care about all that stuff. Man, if I got one more, it would be a nice 10. Can y'all help me come up with one more? I know you got it. Look at these people watching me. I know y'all got it. Can I please have one more nice to have so I can make it an even 10? That would be wonderful. Uh, but like here, here's nine nice to haves. And honestly, I just want you to get one of them. If you can just get one of them, you're gonna make me happy. Really, you need zero of them. You can get a job without any of them. Um, but what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna push you towards this full stack one, uh, at least at first. And then after that, I will rapidly be hitting up these top three. Um, because when we go full stack, we're gonna learn how servers work. Then we're gonna learn how server side rendering works, SSR, static generation. Ooh, maybe that's the number 10. Well, so this would be like DevOps. Static generation gets into like build processes and DevOps, but the thing is, there's no way, you know what, okay, yeah, it, there is a way, there is a way, it's possible. I'll say sysadmin, this is weird, but it does happen sometimes. Um, IT, IT help desk, IT customer service. I've seen this happen, it baffles me, I'm not really sure how it happens. But I've seen people who know DevOps, but they don't know how to code. And it's really baffling to me because that's usually the other way around. Usually you know how to code and then you learn DevOps later. But really there's like some, some sort of, I think it comes through help desks and IT customer service kind of stuff. I don't know. This is kind of shooting in the dark. But I think some of these people kind of start out in customer service. They're a little bit of a super user, IT help desk, higher level help desk, higher level help desk. Now they're like a network admin, sysadmin, um, and they just never learned to code. <laughs> but they, or maybe they're like a hardware, um, like tech hardware background. Um, right? And so DevOps here, you know, that's a loaded term. They might just have like a small piece of that, like server con con configuration specifically. They might not know all about like build and deploy and test, et cetera, on call, whatever, telemetrics or telemetry. Um, but it's still, a, it's still a good background. I'm gonna go with that. If you got a better one, hit me. But now I got a top 10. So keep an eye out in the future. I don't know if I'll do a TikTok or a YouTube video. 10 nice to haves, cool. Actually, I think this is gonna be the part five React. Uh, series. Um, nice to haves. And then I'll probably do one YouTube video, which is like all the five pieces together. Um, so one was the overview. So we got part one, overview. By the way, if you have any React questions, feel free to drop it. I'm brainstorming my Teach React series but totally, totally, definitely interrupt me. Um, Cause we're just here to, to, to learn and to think and to talk react, right? Just check in, uh, TikTok comments do not come in live. So just check in if anyone is asking a question on TikTok. By the way, please do go follow my TikTok channel. I have like hundreds, like about 300 followers now. But if I wanna stream live to TikTok, I need to get to a thousand. So I'd really appreciate your support there. Um, it's been growing like wildfire and I, I've just been growing it for like, like three weeks at this point. And it outgrew my YouTube already, which I've never been super intentional or disciplined with YouTube, but I have been sort of like lazily contributing there for literal years. 
and I've only got like 150 uh, like uh, subscribers or so, and so double that in a month with TikTok. It's wild to me. <coughs> Andy Delafield says, what is an algo interview? Um, I'll give a quick answer to that. Algorithm style interview. It's a particular kind of interview where they give you these um, complex computer science uh, problems, basically. Um, and it's common in what we call the big N employers or top tier one or FANG, like Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, FANG employers, and FANG-like companies. So FANG-like would be like Lyft, Uber. There's all these like weird acronyms like FANG with Uber. Yeah, FANGLED Todd. Uh, I think it's ridiculous. Um, so all these letters, we just ended up calling it big N, which is like however many big ones there are, uh, or we call them tier one. Um, so a lot of them, and then companies that want to emulate their hiring style will also implement algorithm interviews alongside behavioral and like, uh, there's like a series of these. Um, and we call them algorithm interviews because they're more like thought thinking puzzles more so than like, than just a normal coding problem. So like, here's a normal coding problem. See this screen? I would like you to turn the background of this page from white to red. Um, and so we need to know the document API. This whole thing is called a document. And then I need to know how to find an element. Uh, let's look on these elements. I need to know how to maybe debug a bit. You could call this debugging what I'm doing right now, I guess. I'm searching for a particular element. That guy right there, main. Uh, and it has a class of main and an ID of main. So I could get the element by its ID or by its class or by its xpath or whatever else. But I'm going to go document.find or get element by ID. I'm going to go for ID main. So you see, I got that element. And I'm going to do uh, style. I think this is right. Style background equals red, right? And I turned it red. So that was a simple coding problem. By the way, when I gave coding interviews at like no name companies, basically, I did stuff like this. Um, I would I would do a coding interview. I didn't do an algorithm interview. And I would say, you know, let's pretend that you have a blank HTML page. This like a website is technically an HTML page. Let's show you that too. Uh, I think I can show you my desktop background. I don't think there's anything there. Yeah, I keep it pretty spick and span. So let's just use a text document foobar.html. Or let's go text, and then you'll see what I'm talking about. So P is for paragraph. Hi, folks. Um, so right now I have a text file, and this language, it's not really a programming language, but it's a syntax that a computer can understand. Think about it like you're writing a sentence, but instead of like periods, you know how you have to like, you have to use a comma in the right place. You have to use a period in the right place. All of those grammar rules are called your syntax. Similarly, we have programming language syntax. And the idea is that instead of getting a, a computer to understand English, because if you think about it, English is really screwed up. English is actually really hard to understand. Go talk to anyone that is English as a second language. Anyway, I've learned a bit of other languages. I think, for example, Spanish, I think is the rules are much more consistent for conjugation <coughs> compared to English, where we have a bunch of these like loner words from various languages, like French words, like, I don't know, what's a French word? Buffet, is that a, originally from French? I don't know. Uh, and then it's like, why isn't it Buffet? You know, there, and but sometimes it is like Jimmy Buffett. So how do you know? Now you got to parse context. It's really complicated. So programming languages, there are rules that you're not familiar with, but once you learn them, there are actually far fewer rules. They're actually far more consistent and more efficient, and that's why we use these rules. Um, and there's some people out there called computer scientists that helped decide these rules and like, what are like the minimum most efficient rules that we can have? The computer scientists help us figure that out. Um, and then they create languages using these symbols, kind of like math. We have plus, minus, multiply. This is a logical system with symbols that have well-defined rules. And it's the same thing with, uh, with programming. Um, and it really is a language, because a language is similar, 
except that with our normal languages that have socio-culturally evolved over long periods of time, the rules are really complicated and they're hard to change and they're really inefficient so that you can't communicate much information even when you're saying a bunch of words like I'm doing right now. That's what we mean by efficiency, by the way, is how much information can I get through with a certain amount of time, with a certain amount of effort, with a certain amount of energy, with a certain amount of financial cost or other sorts of cost. So basically, uh, programming languages have similar rules just like a normal language, but they have been optimized uh, by computer scientists to make them technically efficient so that your computer can do a bunch of stuff. You can do a bunch of stuff um, with not that much um, file space. They can have these like small, uh, small files. Uh, and with their tiny computer brains that are increasingly cool, but they really pale in comparison to the human brain. Um, so here's an example. So one of these rules is if you want to have a paragraph, it needs to start with this. We call that a left angle bracket. We call that the letter P and we call that a right angle bracket. And so these three symbols together make what we call a paragraph open tag and then left angle bracket backslash trailing slash, uh, just called a slash sometimes it's called all three of those things. Uh, and then a P and then a right angle bracket. These four symbols say, hey, that we're done with that most recent paragraph. I'm just teaching you HTML now. And so now I have a paragraph that says, hi folks. And this is a text file. I'm gonna put it in my browser and you're gonna see that it doesn't do any, it doesn't do anything. Whoa, well, okay, it does something. It just puts the text there. So my browser, my Chrome browser, knows to render a text file like this. Render is how it shows up. That's what we mean by render, draw. Um, but if I just change it to HTML, instead of .txt, now it's .html, now my browser thinks it's a website. Bam! The P doesn't show up. Now it's just a paragraph that says, hi folks. And basically, um, all this crazy stuff is just a bunch of HTML. <clears throat> and then there's two other related things called CSS and JavaScript. <laughs> so I'm not going to give you a course on that right now. Um, the point of that is that uh, that's the difference between a coding interview and an algorithm interview. A coding interview is going to ask you technicals about HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, things that actually impact a website that almost all people will be seeing, developers will be interacting with very frequently. So like this document API that I talked about is a thing that developers will be using all the time. So it's checking, almost checking your muscle memory as a developer. Do you know how to do the day-to-day? -day? Algorithm interviews are not checking muscle memory. They're not checking day-to-day. -day. They're checking, can you think beyond the day-to-day -day into these really deep and abstract puzzles like, um, What's an example of an algorithm interview? Um, let's say that I'm sitting right here, and what I want to know um, is the three most common minerals in the river closest to my house. Um, and then let's pretend that Google Maps gives me the actual technical information so that I can think about that question, but then how do I go about using that Google Maps API and uh, basically answering that question, what are the three most common minerals at any given time? How do I answer that question in a technically efficient way? So that's what algorithm interviews are gonna ask you for. Um, and then they would ask you like, okay, how do you know it's technically efficient? They'll ask you about things like time complexity and space complexity and what if it's not just you asking this question? What if like, you need to actually build a website? This would be systems design. You actually need to build a website that thousands of people are going to use. And it's not just your river by your house. It's everyone's river by everyone's house all across the world. And uh, like, what if a server goes down? All these, all these questions um, that are basically outside of the ordinary and they're, they're checking that you really know, let's say the edges of complex systems design instead of the basics. They're testing more for the edges than the basics. 
So a lot of people throw this out and say it's really annoying. Um, like, why are you asking these deep and abstract questions? I'm not even gonna be doing that on my day-to-day -day job. I sympathize with that a lot. My answer, I, I have a couple answers though, because I actually sympathize with both sides because I know why employers do that. The reason they do that is because Facebook is getting a bajillion applications and a bunch of the bajillion applications are really smart people. <laughs> and they wanna know the difference between the top 1% and the top 1% of 1% of that 1%. Like they wanna know the super nerds versus just like the normal developer. So that's why they ask these crazy difficult, crazy questions. And that's why it's an abnormal interview process. Most of the industry is not asking these questions except you have some like wannabe companies that are literally like, oh, Google and Facebook do it, therefore we should do it, which is like a terrible HR process, but they do exist. Most of the industry is gonna to be totally happy that if you answer the coding questions, uh, they're totally happy to hire you. So thanks for the question, Andy. That was a fun tangent. I, how much time do I have left today? I was trying to go for an hour. Oh, so I got like five or 10 minutes left. So yeah, if you got another question, hit me up. Otherwise, I will return to formulating the master plan here. So part one is the overview. Part two, oh, we haven't actually been to Code Academy. Part two is the uh, React Core like, uh, like a pirate. I almost wanna say a la pirate, but then that might be, what is he saying, a la? <laughs> like a pirate. I'm gonna stick with the three R's, although we could throw async await in there because technically it is. Um, but I think the async await goes for that A there. Let me double check my whiteboard. What was the... Uh... Yeah, no, I think it's the same thing. I think there's only one A. It like you could do one A for async await or you could do two A's for async await. I'm not really sure that one is better than the other. <clears throat> and I think it's the same A here. So here, this is Prisma and I'm trying to see my whiteboard. What does the H stand for? Hooks, hooks, hooks. So what is the P? Hooks are essential. Prisma is not essential. Prisma is a nice to have. Props. Props. Okay, yeah. Um, React, Core, REST, and Redux. Um, React under the hood implies these things. Oh, um, yeah, ES6. from functional, compo functional components. So what is fat? Let's see. Fat is uh, functional components. And I'm really pushing back against, um, I'm really pushing back against the ES2015 style functions as well as class components. Those are older in React, right? I'm pushing back against those. When I say rest, another reason to specify rest is to push back against GraphQL. I'm doing that intentionally. Where'd, where'd my rest go? Rest. I just put it there. Not GraphQL. Let me move that. Um, so a bunch of people think that GraphQL is really cool, and it is really cool. Um, but the majority of employers want you to know rest. And GraphQL is considered like a step above rest. So if you know GraphQL without knowing REST, you're jumping the shark, you're jumping the gun, cart before the horse. Employers don't want that, they don't like that. There is, there is a perception, even of framework students, if you know the framework and you don't know the vanilla JS underneath, you don't know the ES6 underneath, the HTML, CSS, you don't know the parts underneath, that's a problem. You wanna know those low level components and know the framework above it and what the framework is doing to make that easier for you. If you can build on the framework and know like a higher level framework, that's really cool too.
But circling back, um, you gotta know the basics first. And so we want you to know fetch and async await. And like that also includes promises, of course, because async await, like they already are promises. You should know this stuff um, before GraphQL. Maybe instead of saying not GraphQL, I should come down here and do <sighs> GraphQL um, algorithms um, alternative data, like DB structures, like an actual graph database, inverting a binary tree, a quad tree, and an octa tree. <laughs> Whittington flexed on me today. I made a joke about a quad tree and then he made a joke about an octa tree and I was like, dang, he really got me. Um, these are all nice to have. It's like your AWS cert infrastructure, these are all really things that are like way above the scope of a junior. <laughs> this is like senior level stuff. So if you have it, no shade, um, from the point of view of my course, that is like not the scope of my course. That's like way out of bounds for my course. And it's not like it's bad. It's just not what I want to teach because I want to teach people who have no clue about code or maybe they know something but they're having trouble getting a job teach to, to, or even if they're a great programmer in another language but they want to learn React and web development. I want to teach them so that they can get a job in web development. That's my goal. So all this other stuff is cool um, but you can learn it later and if you learn it first and you don't, like what if you only know algorithms and you don't know REST? You're gonna be a terrible programmer and you might be able to land a job um, but you're gonna you're you're gonna annoy a lot of people. Um, you might be able to land a job. I'd have to think about that. If you know algorithms and you don't know REST, there are people like this, and I bet they can get a job. So kudos to them. Why don't I do it then? Uh, because if someone comes to me from scratch, it's gonna be harder to teach them algorithms. It's gonna be harder and less useful to teach them algorithms from scratch than to teach them rest from scratch. Yeah, so you need to know basic programming and then you can learn algorithms. You need to know basic programming and then you can learn rest. This is true, but rest is still easier to teach. Is that like Chrome DevTools right here? Is that why? I think it's more the utility thing. I don't know, maybe this is a bad choice. Let me know. If you think, hey, I should be teaching algorithms, not rest. To me, it feels like what I would be doing there is I would be training someone to go for a big N or tier one company instead of rest, which uh, would be expected by the rest of the industry. Um, and I can see for some people, that's a good choice. If they do wanna take the extra gamble and go for that top tier company, that could be the right choice for you. Let me know. I'm happy to tailor my curriculum to you if we're working together personally. My intuition, and I could be wrong, but my intuition is that if I'm trying to give you the best odds of landing a job, I should not target the tier one companies. I should target the 90, 95, 99% of the industry and teach you rest. And that if you get through all this stuff, it's gonna be fairly straightforward to learn algorithms after that. That's my intuition, so that's my strategy the John way, but I'm happy to customize it for you. And I'm not stubborn on that. If you say, Hey, I will take a 10% chance of landing a thing job over a 90% chance of landing a no name job. If that's just your value weighting, then I'm happy to tailor that for you. I think, yeah, my default is just a conservative risk position. Let's target the lower pay, higher odds jobs. Okay, great. Functional components, async await. Um, and then that is, you know, plus fetch, plus promises. You could do Axios, but I'm gonna go with fetch because it's built in. And what was the T? Rest, read up. Oh, thunks, thunks. The T is thunks. Because if you learn Redux, we need to have a middleware, and I think thunks are easier to understand than sagas. Um, 
in my mind, thunks are just the way that Redux can make a REST request. Yeah, and that's why I wanted to teach REST first, because now that you know REST, it's, it's that much easier to teach uh, Redux with thunks, because it's like the whole purpose of thunks. It's not the whole purpose, but it's the, it's, in my experience, it's been the main use case. There are other middleware use cases, but in my experience, the main use case of thunks is to make a network request and store the result in, in your Redux store. <laughs> okay, cool. So this is making sense to me. React core like a pirate. We never did the dang thing. Let me show you. This is this. I like free code camp because it's free, right? Um, so like, if you do these top three ones, you can get a job. I believe that. So let's go through them. Responsive web design, HTML, great. CSS, great. Um, some of these I think you can skip, but I still think they're great. Like applied visual design, I don't think you need that. Applied accessibility, I'm gonna get in the hot water because accessibility is important, but you really don't need it. And what I mean by you really don't need it is, for better or worse, employers give a really low weight to accessibility. And let's call a spade a spade. That is because most consumers don't have these requirements. So as a result, employers don't prioritize those functional requirements that highly. In government contracting, accessibility is called 508 compliance. It's literally like the lowest priority thing in almost every government project. They're always scrambling to do it at the end. If you become a 508 expert, you're gonna land a job very easily. And it's probably, gonna, they're gonna hire you for a short time and let you go. Like that's what happens to 508 specialists. Um, so you really don't need it. Although it's a really nice, nice to have, as I said before. Responsive web design principles, sure, why not, why not? Media queries, you're gonna need that. Image responsiveness, you're eventually gonna run into it, might as well knock it out. It said something about making your own font, that feels like a little over the top, but if it's a short lesson, why not? Um, so basically, I feel like this curriculum is pretty good. CSS Grid, awesome, thank you so much for you, and Flexbox, love it. These are gonna be great. You, you really don't need grid for employers. Some employers will care about Flexbox, but frankly, frankly, most won't. But uh, even for your own side projects, you're gonna wanna use Flexbox. It's just really useful. Like as a developer, you're gonna enjoy Flexbox. It's kind of tricky to get your head around at first, but you're gonna really enjoy it. JavaScript, yeah, they got the primitives down, loops, all that. Um, I think you can skip OOP for JavaScript. You can learn it later. Um, so some of this stuff you can kind of skip and speed up. Palindrome checker, like this is extra, but okay, whatever. It's kind of, yeah, detecting a palindrome is another basic algorithm. These are some really, okay, let's do them. They're actually fairly quick. You can knock all these out in a day or less. Um, and it gives you a good idea of what a basic algorithm looks like. So that's useful. Where I have a problem is with how they do read up. So they come over here, they say bootstrap. You really don't need bootstrap, but fine. jQuery, this one gave me a red flag. jQuery is super dated. Not only do you not need it, the fact that you roll up to an, a, an interview and you're like, I know jQuery, it's almost a negative. It's like, why are you studying that? Do you have your head in the wrong place? Like that's old. SAS, you really don't need it. If it's quick, knock it out. If it's not quick, whatever. I, I guess you should go ahead and learn it. A bunch of React Skeleton apps are gonna be using SAS anyway. So here's what concerned me. When I looked into what do they, I'm glad they teach React Core, but what do they actually teach here? This concerns me. A React component, they're using class, right? This is the old way and they say ES6 class, and if you're a newbie, this is confusing because you're like, isn't ES6 new? Yes and no. Um, ES6 is new in the scheme of JavaScript, but class components are old in the scheme of React because <laughs> React is like a newer library. So I get that that's confusing. Basically, these will work and you will get a job, but you will get on that job and you will immediately need to know you'll immediately have to learn new React. So why not just learn new React? I'm a fan of learning whatever applies to the most jobs. 
And then if you need to patch an old skill and pick up an old legacy skill, I would rather you do that on the job. At interview time, you're gonna learn, you're gonna look awesome if you know the latest and greatest. Um, and then they are not gonna shame you. No one's gonna shame you if you learned the cutting edge technology and you don't know that employer's old legacy technology, no one's gonna shame you. They're gonna say, awesome, you learned the cool new thing. We can totally hire you and you can learn the old way. That's usually how employers approach it. And so that's how I employ it, it, it approach it as a teacher. So you got class components. Um, yeah, it's just like this is, you're gonna have a ton of experience with class components and, and it says, here's a stateless functional component. But if you look at this functional component, this is not actually what we mean by a functional component. This is the old ES2015 style function. Um, how we do a functional component today would be like, uh, my component equals uh, like props, fat arrow, uh, like h1, foobar, close h1. By the way, um, if you've never seen React before, that is a functional component. It's really not that hard. I could also do it like this, um, title. Um, I wanna be a little more complicated, I'll do it like that. And all that did is now I have a dynamic title. So I could say like, my component title equals foobar. And that would be the one that I wrote a second ago. But now I could change this anytime I want. Right? So that's a custom component. Um, and if you remember the HTML earlier from the P tag, it looks a lot like that. That's all React is. It's, it's letting you make your own HTML. That's putting it very roughly for newbies. Don't hate on me if you're some like, you know what? If you're literally a React developer and you're going to hate on me for that explanation, you're a terrible React developer because that's a good explanation if you're trying to explain it to somebody that doesn't understand how to program. It's just making, it's just make your, making your own custom HTML, basically. So we need functional components. And, that, and so if you learn the free code camp thing, you're probably gonna get a job, but it's not putting you in the strongest position. And then if you look at how they do Redux, I was like, oh, they do React and Redux, this is great. It will atone for their sins. No, they're doing, re they're doing Redux the old way too. Um, like, look at how they create their store. Store. They did have stores. Okay. Create a Redux store. You see this? They're not using Toolkit. They're using Create Store. Um, these days, if you go get like a brand spanking new version of Redux, you're supposed to use the Redux Toolkit. Um, So the Redux is old, define an action, cr action creator. Like all of this should be using Redux toolkit that greatly simplifies the way that actions, dispatch, reducing, selection. Toolkit changes how you do all this. Um, copy an object with object.assign. Like, like you, don't, you just don't write it like this anymore. Um, And then the connector. You don't even use the connector anymore. I mean, sometimes in an edge case you'll need to, but usually we, we're using Redux hooks now. That's the thing, hooks. So in my, fat, in my fatter, I specify hooks. You really need to learn hooks. Hooks are the new React, and hooks are the new Redux. You should be using Redux with hooks. Use dispatch, use selector, stuff like that. Um, so when they connect it, they connect it the old way. Connect Redux to React. See down here at the bottom, const connect, and then they want you to basically use this connection, which is in map state to props. This is all old Redux. Now, let's be clear, most employers are still gonna be happy that you know Redux. And they're gonna be like, they'll say something that's probably ridiculous, like, oh, you'll just learn the new Redux in two weeks. Uh, no. <laughs> Um, but if you get the job, you get the job, I guess. But I'm literally, as your mentor, I'm like, I would hate for you to do all this learning work. Even though you get a job, that's great, but you're just gonna have to learn it all again. 
why don't we just teach you the new thing? So that's how I'm going for it. So, but here's, so those are all the negatives with free code camp. Here's the huge benefit, dude, it's free. <laughs> um, so the other one that I like, I really have three options. One work with me, two free code camp and three code academy. And if you work with me, you're going to have to pay me. So the free option is really free, free code camp. Here's Codecademy. Codecademy used to be free when I used it and I learned it and I taught myself and it was good enough. Now they do have a free tier, but honestly, I think it's pretty terrible. I would not recommend Codecademy free. They have a free tier and I don't recommend it. I do recommend their pro tier. But here's the thing though, it's 40 bucks a month. 20 bucks a month, right? Well, you gotta pay for a whole year up front. If you have that money, go for it. By the way, if you work with me, the way I do it is I pay for your Code Academy. You do Code Academy Pro. You don't pay me a dime until after you get your job. So that way, you get to use Code Academy Pro with a deferred payment, basically. So Code Academy themselves, they don't have a deferred payment, but I just basically defer it for you. Because I really believe in Code Academy. Code Academy is what I used when I taught myself. And now let's go search. Um, they changed the web website around a little bit, but let's search web developer. Um, skill path, course, course. We can go to the skill path, I guess. Here's learn React catalog. Yeah, here you go. Um, pro career path. I also think it's more impressive if you go to an employer and your certification is, I have a certificate from Codecademy for the front end engineer career path. Um, I think that's more impressive than the certificate from Free Code Camp. If you have a different opinion on this, especially if you're an employer, I'd love to hear your opinion because I could be wrong on this. But the front end development libraries certification, I personally think that's less impressive. It's, it's like you're a front end development library certification. I think that's less impressive than a front-end engineer career credential. This is saying I'm set for a career as a front-end engineer. I think mapping to the job description is more impressive than mapping to a skill. Um, by the way, Codecademy also has skill level certificates uh, with a, they call it skills path. Where's that skill? Yeah, like, so this is Python, but whatever. It would say, master statistics with Python. Oh, Python. Okay, I got that skill. Does that mean I'm ready to be like a data scientist, data analyst, data engineer, you know, uh, Django developer? No, I've learned one skill and you actually need a ton of skills to be a developer. Um, and so the, the career path certifies that and it says I have all the skills to be a front end engineer. The free code camp thing, I think it does give you the skills. It just doesn't, when an employer reads it, it doesn't give the impression that you have the skills. Um, it, looks like, it looks like you have three skills. Responsive web design, JavaScript algorithms, which is almost like a weird thing. It's like, okay, you know JavaScript algorithms, but do you know JavaScript though? You see how it's like raising questions? Front end development libraries. Okay, you know the library, but to be a developer, there's all this surrounding stuff. Um, one example would be Git, you know, just using the command line, which you're gonna have to learn the command line as a self-taught developer to like get your portfolio going in GitHub, you're going to learn the command line. It just doesn't certify that you learned it. Um, I think they might have a different one. APIs and microservices certification. What even is that? So does this mean that you don't know what an API is? If you got the library cert, but you didn't get the API cert. So this is almost like that REST thing. You learn JavaScript algorithms, you learned React, um, but you never learned my APIs. So do you actually know REST? Do you actually know how to fetch? By the time you get done with this, you will know how to fetch, but it's raising questions in the employer's mind. Here, um, it says web development fundamentals. And the funny thing is they basically teach you nothing. Like Codecademy basically teaches you nothing here. But the way the employer reads it is, 
oh, you learned all the web development fundamentals. You have this really solid basis, right? So you see how we're prepping ourselves to win at the interview time. Like, oh, I know web development fundamentals. I took a course in it. Codecademy certified it. Like, relax, dude. I know that there's more to it than just React. There's all this surrounding stuff. And according to Codecademy, I'm not even bragging. Like I have, according to Codecademy, they said that I did it. Do you trust them? They've been around for a while. They're trustworthy. TDD fundamentals. This makes you look really awesome. The funny thing is, is you take this and you're, and you're like barely competent at TDD, right? I, I don't actually even think you're competent at TDD when you finish this. Like I, anyway, not to trash Codecademy, I really like them. But when an employer does that, they're like, whoa, that's an advanced skill. Uh, look, it's literally called advanced concepts in TDD, right? Um, I thought they have one for Git. Where's Git? Command line Git GitHub. There you go. So there's actually a Codecademy module for that, um, which it really is important. And some people do struggle with that. I believe personally that you can just, I think this is like a simple topic. You can just Google. But some people struggle, struggle with that when there's a lack of organization. They might learn this and then, oh man, how do I get it onto GitHub? It becomes like a huge ro roadblock for them. I think if you're a self-starter, you can just Google it and get over that hurdle. It's really not, it's really not difficult. But the fact that it's here is nice for two reasons. One, if you are that type of person who needs that structure, it's here for you. And I think more important than that, it tells the employer that you have this whole other skill set, which as developers we know is actually like a small, basic, like small thing. But to, a, to an employer, they're thinking about it as a much bigger thing um, if they're non-technical. And, and a lot of these employers that are not tier one, they're the 90, 95, 99% of the industry. A lot of these hiring managers aren't technical. Project managers with a project management background, not with a tech background. They're not, a lot of them are not like the engineering managers that you'll have that do have a technical background in tier one. That's very different. Uh, I thought there was also something about agile here, but I'm not seeing it. So um, if you work with me, that's another one of those things that I'll teach you about is like agile. Is there agile here? So there's not, so neither one of them really teaches you about agile. So that's like another skill you can throw on your resume if you work with me personally. Um, but it's another one of those things that's actually not a big deal, um, but employers think it's a big deal. Okay. So basically the thing that I've come to, oh, and they have hooks and stuff. Did I tell you that? I went over here to Codecademy. React hooks. This is the literally the reason that I actually even wanted to have this podcast is because I believe there's eight results for React Hooks. I believe they teach React Hooks in here, but I didn't actually go and take the course. So let me dive in maybe for five minutes. Try for free, log in. I'm gonna try for five minutes to do this. Uh, Oh, what? Can I just log in with GitHub? Like I've never done that before. This is concerning. I thought I have done that before. Did I log in with Google? Okay, I logged in with Google. Try P Pro for free. We're gonna do this. Uh, I'm gonna take that off screen. Let's go monthly. Credit. Uh, I forgot my... CVC. Oh, okay, I got my wallet.
Codecademy Pro trial has started. Congratulations. All right, everyone. We'll see if my uh, stream gets shut down because I am actually streaming Codecademy Pro right now. So you can see that I used Codecademy like a long time ago and I 100% completed Learn How to Code. <laughs> um, and I think I like completed some courses they don't even have anymore. Um, Like, I think I did their old, an old learn JavaScript. What I want to do is I want to dive right into those that I was talking about. <clears throat> so they have a syllabus, it said, huh? Syllabus. Do you have hooks? Redux core concepts quiz. Let's just jump right to the quiz. Maybe this is the way. Maybe this is the way. Look at that. OK. See, this is the way, baby. Code Academy. I still love you. And look, they got a button, get unstuck. One of the things I love about both of these companies, Free Code Camp really is really great. I, I hope this doesn't come off as me talking trash about them. They provide a huge benefit all over the world. Their open source, open source contribution model is really great. Even after you get the Code Academy cert, you can partner with Free Code Camp to contribute to some of their projects. And that's going to make you look amazing because you're, now you're an open source contributor. And free code camp is free, which to people in my position, the fact that you pay, you know, 40 or 80 bucks for a couple months of Code Academy is literal nothing. Um, like I could probably blow my nose and make that money. But it was not always like this. And I think that's why I'm different than a lot of other developers. Like I came from the dirt. Um, so I understand how it's so worth it and so not a big deal now. But I also understand, dude, back when I like, was part-time at Walmart and could barely afford an apartment and was eating ramen for my meals, like, I didn't have 10 bucks, you know? <laughs> so how am I gonna get 100 bucks? Um, so I really see both sides of it. And so, look, if it's all that you can do, like, don't put, like, don't put yourself in debt. Do the free code camp thing, that's fine. But if you got 100 bucks, I think this is a great investment. Because this is, you're not gonna have to learn it twice. It's gonna save you hours. And really, that's the, the deal. Let's say that you land, you're gonna land a job for, for like, on the absolute lowest, this would actually be a total insult if you got 60K. Uh, and then there's about 2,000 hours in a year. Um, so chop off the 1,000, so now you got 60 divided by two, right? So this is your rough hourly rate at a minimum. Uh, and then it could go, let's say, easily up to 90. If you go over 90, now you're looking at like those tier one companies. Don't get me wrong, those tier one companies would even start you at, at, at 140, 150. Um, but I, I think that's unrealistic that you're gonna get a job there. So I'm seeing like 30 to $45 an hour. So think of that in six months, you could, so the money that you spent to get Codecademy Pro instead of free Code Camp, you could make back in like half a day of work, right? Think about it like that. It's, it's an investment, not even into your distant future. It's an investment into the U of six months from now. Um, and I think that you'll find that it's, that it's worth it to go spit that hundred bucks. But you can also work with me I'll pay it for you. I'll pay for the other stuff that I got for you too. But I'm gonna be like uh, like $7,500. But again, it's not gonna be until you get a job and we can do payment plan and whatever. But I, I think the bang for the buck is with Codecademy Pro. Like I don't think signing up with me is your bang for the buck. Signing up with me is like if you need the help, even if you're like a terrible developer, I can make you awesome. And if you're like struggling, basically if you're, like really where my time is best spent is if you try to do Code Academy and you're getting stuck and you're like, I need someone. That's when I think you should reach out to me. If I were in your shoes, I would not reach out to me. If I were in your shoes, I would be doing Code Academy because that's exactly what I did. Um, so we know it's got hooks. Okay, let me actually answer the question. Uh, fill in the reducer function so that it updates state immutably. The set too late, set too late. Even though this is a fat arrow, it is still the old, uh, well, this is initial state. Yeah, it's still the old reducer. They're not using Redux Toolkit. 
the set to late action should set the is late property to true. ETA. I don't think so. Oh, okay, the question is, is it state or is it, uh, okay. Uh, I'm not sure if that's right, actually. Okay. Um, so it's a destructured state immutably. That's the keyword there. We destructure state, and it's going to create a whole new state instead of passing the reference to the old state. Okay, cool. What must an action have? It has a payload. Uh, not all actions have a payload. News to me. Which statement best defines Redux? A store object? No. A pattern for updating state? In a pretty, yep. A library for managing and updating application state? Sure. Uh, it's actually better defined as a library than a pattern. Flux is the pattern. A library for render, yeah. So I'm gonna go this one, cool. So this is all cool. This is not what I really wanna waste my time checking. Let's go ahead and knock it out. One way data flow, view actions, okay. <coughs> I don't know, view action view, no. Store view, no. Store action, I think, I th okay. Store view. I would need to know what they meant by view. View to me, I'm thinking the actual component, which it doesn't go store straight to component, so they must mean something else. I don't really care about this. Define a valid action so that new state equals gotta go fast. <laughs> I really don't care about this. I'm gonna bail out. Um, you're using ES6 functions. That is one thing that I'm looking for. I want to know if you, and you're not using React Toolkit, that is the other thing I wanna know. I want to know if you're using the class component connector, because that would be bad. This is like the theoretical model of Redux, which I really don't care about. You're going to make me do this stuff. I think we're going to bail out. OK, learn React. Um, syllabus. Advanced JSX, an animal fun facts project. Oh, intro to JSX and advanced are both free, it seems. <coughs> That's great. Let's do the quiz. React and React DOM, we're off to a good start. Class versus class name, yeah, of course. I want to skip. Can I not skip around? Oh, course menu, maybe that was the right button. Yeah, okay, here we go. Um, it doesn't want me to skip around. So it's like force. So I think once you go through all the lessons, then you can skip around, but it doesn't want you to skip forward. React, react dot create element. I'm not, I'm not liking that. What is the correct way to attach the function yo? Okay, so here at least it's an arrow function to a click event. Uh, where's my event in there? That's fine. I didn't actually mean to click that, fuck. What's wrong with this code? There's no wrapper. Uh, outermost element, yeah. What should you pass to react dom.render for its first argument? You really shouldn't use react dom.render. Uh, like the data technically. Um, a JSX expression that you want to compile. I don't actually know. Okay. I think we're going to bail out of this too. I wanted to know if you use hooks. And I should be able to see it in the course for React JSX Advanced. Course menu. Show me hooks, baby. I'm not seeing it. Um, right, when I search React hooks, create an advanced web app with React and Redux. Get started, okay. I got the pro thing, right?
Use React hooks. That's what I like to see. Okay, we both learned something. The good news is Codecademy Pro has hooks. That's what I wanted to see. We were able to demonstrate that. And it has a newer Redux. Uh, before I get diverted on the Redux, you have to do the skill path. So this is even a note to myself. Create advanced web app with React and Redux skill path. Put that in my notepad over here. So I'm going to officially recommend that. Um, does it use toolkit though? Yep, handle asynchronous code and implement. Ooh, baby. Ooh, baby, I love the way. Code Academy, you really, you really never let me down. So this has to be essential now. This skill path is essential. Skill path. All right, cool. That is all the questions that I had in my mind for this stream. So really what I've done here is I've solidified prefer code Academy pro. Um, if a free option is needed, go for free code camp. Um, dated, it has dated tech, but that's okay. It's, um, it's not going to be a big damper on your ability to get a job. It's mostly just going to be, it's, it's going to maybe put a little bit of a damper on your ability to get a job. But what it's really going to do is after you get that job, you're going to have to spend a few more months upgrading your tech. But, you know, I think that's like a relearning cost is much more than job threat. Maybe 1% to 10% job threat. Um, so it'll like dampen your job search a little, but not really that much. It's just you're going to have to learn it all again. And then uh, you would really only want to work with me if you're if you're like struggle bussing on the above. So now we got our part two ironed out. I still need to think through uh, parts three and four, but I think we got part five ironed out. So this has been a great hour and 40 minutes for me. Um, usually I like to keep it to an hour, but um, we got up to that hour mark and I still hadn't looked into this. So thanks for hanging in there with me. Let me make sure I got no more remaining questions. None that I can see. Hey, thanks for tuning in. And uh, yeah, it's Wednesday. So what remains of your Wednesday? Make it great. <laughs>